he was gonna hello and welcome to this month's episode of pipes and piety i am your host james and of course i am joined by tristan and micah how are we guys i'm doing good how are you i'm good micah I said guys, Micah. I didn't just say Tristan. So well, Tristan was just talking about how he was going to edit me out of all these podcasts. So I, I yeah, I was, I just, I've, so what I've been debating. You're not going to talk at all. That um, way, there's nothing to I'm edit. Just going to listen. No, you said my name first whenever you said you were joined by Tristan and Micah. So oh, I see. I see. It just made sense for me to go first. I see. I I'm love excited, you, Micah. guys. Micah is really excited. I'm so really excited. excited to put you behind the wall a little bit to let you behind the pipes and piety wall. This was uh, supposed to be recorded last week. But we had just kind of a, a speed bump of, you know, theological. Basically, we wanted to make this the best episode we could make for you guys. And we did not think we were there. And so we took some time. We studied for a whole nother week. And now we're here. And that is why Mike is excited. Cause, yeah. yeah. I also appreciate these guys because they actually have humility and <laughs> recognize that we weren't in. We just needed to spend some more time. Yeah. Yeah, we we're be, all tired and be good. Speaking of being yeah. good and not tired because we're actually excited now. Yeah. But speaking of being good, we actually have more um, professional gear. We have. So you might realize right. that the sound quality is a lot better. Hopefully we're Name, hoping. Namely from my side of the room. <laughs> you can probably already notice I'm able to be heard. Yes. <laughs> Tristan got himself a awesome little mic. And yeah. So let us know uh, either on our Facebook page, Twitter, Instagram. You can find us Pipes and Piety, or what would be awesome if you dropped a little five star review and a paragraph about what you love about Pipes and Piety. Speaking and that, of five star reviews, oh. James. Oh yeah, yes. And speaking of the five star reviews, yeah. So we had a five star review from a gentleman named Rick from DFW, and he said, "This is a this is great. Love the podcast. I was looking for another pipe smoking podcast as a Christian. This is even better. Looking forward to the next episode." And gave us five stars. So that's pretty awesome. Mm. I thought that was really encouraging since we're still fairly new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's Getting, our first outsider. Yeah. Well, really, it's our first review, and it's not even a friend. True. It's no one right. we know. Well, none of us. None now. of us know him. Oh, he's yeah. my friend. Yeah. Um, Rick, if you're also, listening, we love you, man. I love you too. I told, oh, I forgot what I was going to say. Okay, let's go. Well, on. since he is so he was well, talking about uh, this being a pipes podcast, we should probably let him know what, what what our plan is with the actual pipe smoking and everyone who's listening. Oh yeah. yeah. So right now, right now, just because of circumstances, we record inside of a church building, and um, just to be out of respect for our fellow members, covenant members, we don't want to smoke inside the church. So we do not smoke during uh, recording. Recording? <laughs> Sorry, we do so, not smoke during recording. I'm leaving that in. <laughs> but Mike and I, we, we get together every once in a while, and I know Micah partakes more... More recently. More, <laughs> more regularly. More regularly than I do. Uh, but we, we do outside. We... Basically, we enjoy a pipe, and we enjoy theology and piety, and so that is where the name comes from. So we're still, you know, enjoying pipes, just not on the, the show future, yet. In the future, it'll be more frequent. In the when show. you start hearing that, you know we're in. Yeah, and you hear some. <laughs> that'll be Tristan on his bubble pipe. Yep, <laughs> I but, will. I will be the only one not smoking a pipe. So no. something that the reviews brought up to me, and I wanted to ask you guys. Uh, because the reviews are for people to say what they think about Pipes and Piety and what Pipes and Piety means to them. I wanted to ask you guys, a little get to know us, a little behind the scenes. What does Pipes and Piety mean to you guys? What's, what's Oh, so, you're talking to us. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking to you guys. I'm sorry. See? Well, they're not going to answer us back right now. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> I'm just going to wait. Live. I will wait for, I'll be Dora the Explorer. I'll just wait for your answer and then go, great. And then move on. And no, we no, have no. To say yeah. it like three times <laughs> in <laughs> Spanish and English. Um, whichever one wants to go for it. What does what's pipes and pie mean for you? Or I can go first because I, I I'm the one that thought the question. Do up, it. So okay, let's hear it, Jim. So really, what I love about this is not just that we get to record and that you all, the audience, get to listen, but that this is almost this is a sanctifying thing just for the three of us here. At least it is for me. Um. I know I've grown deeper 
in faith and in thought. Just the short time that we've been doing this, it's got me studying again. I was not studying for a while, just, you know, coasting on Sunday to, Sunday sermons. And uh, so, no, it's it's been really good just because it's got me studying again, got me... Uh, especially this 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 episode, this episode's topic and this series topic that we're going to talk about that has got us kind of grinding and thinking about words and that words have a lot of meaning and mm-hmm. you know. So yeah, what about you guys? I should have gone first because I was going to say something like that. I was going to say something like that. <laughs> well, <laughs> so I've I've learned a lot, way more than I expected I would. Um. And I've really appreciated that and been a- and appreciated being able to do that with these two uh, wonderful gentlemen here. Um, sorry, James is just getting a drink of water, being weird about it. Anyways. <laughs> I waterfalled. I don't drink after other people. I totally forgot. To yeah, he's, a- he's out of water because Micah went to go get him water and forgot to get him water. So, <laughs> so you don't hear a smacking and... Oh gosh. Anyway. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> so you were saying, sorry. No, yeah, I, I was done. I was done. Okay. Yeah. The the people that are, are listening will know what I said. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so Micah. Yeah. Uh, now you're last. I remember so you have to come up with the last. So one. when we started this, I remember thinking like and this is still my attitude. I don't it doesn't matter if people actually listen to this. Like if we weren't even publishing yes. this, I would still do it because we're growing as friends and as brothers in Christ and we're iron sharpening iron, right? Yeah. yeah. Like the Bible talks about yeah. and we're uh, building each other up. Uh, another thing that I get out of it is being, I don't know, studying stuff all day. I have a lot of stuff in my head, but no outlet to mm. express yeah. the things that I'm learning, which is very frustrating because I'm passionate about it. And your wife can only take so much. Yes. My wife, yeah. It only takes so much, too. I understand. So this is a good outlet to actually use the things that God is teaching me and building in me. <laughs> good. All right. So that brings us to something that we are going to try. Um, we are going to try a series. So basically the next probably year, maybe longer because it's a dense topic, and we want to make sure we hit everything we think we need to hit. So what is that series? That series is? Uh, the church. The e- church. Ecclesiology. Ecclesiology. To be specific, the study of the church. So. Study of the church. Now, why is the study of the church so important? Because we are the church. Sunday like that. school answer. No, no, no. It, yeah, but it's one of those, like, how do you know what you're a part of if you don't right. know what it is? Right. right. I think there's this reality that we seclude the church to a building mm-hmm. and we re- when we realize the legacy that has been building up to this that oh, God yeah. has been working throughout history uh, and we're a part of that. And yeah. 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 It's pretty awesome. It is. Um yeah, I, I heard um recently a, a gentleman and it was before this I was listening to a podcast and he was talking about why he thought ecclesiology was so important. And he had a group of church planners who are literally planting churches. And he'd add, he kind of, in conversation, would ask them, you know, what, do you, what do you think the church is? And he, he said like 75% of them really didn't have a clear answer. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, well, it's, you know, it's the group on Sunday. It's, it's, uh, it's the people. It's the building. It's, you know. And so if the guys who are planning churches have a hard time deciphering what the church is, you know, how much more are Mm -hmm. people who aren't actively starting churches and aren't actively working in ministry, um, misunderstanding what the church is. Yeah. So, so let's jump right into it. Ecclesiology. What does it mean, Micah? Well, Tristan pretty much already answered that. Give us, go go a little bit more. Give us some Greek. We want Greek. Greek Greek to me. We want Greek in here, man. (laughs) Our listeners well, want Greek. So <laughs> the difficulty with theology is there's a lot of big words a lot of times, and that can scare people away. So we want to uh, be humble with the way we use lingo, I guess. Um, but the the reason we are not just saying the study of the church or, or the theology of the church, which is essentially what ecclesiology is, is because if we look at 
the Greek uh, root of ecclesiology, which is ecclesia, we really get uh, into more of what the church is. So if we're going to answer the question of what or who the church is, we need to look at what the root is, right? So anytime we see in the New Testament referring to the church, the word is ecclesia. And the root of that means an assembly who is called out or a calling out of assembled people. In the context that these are used in are the church body being assembled together. It's even used um, in a different word, the Hebrew word, which is used in the Old Testament, re- referring to the Israelites being assembled. So immediately we're thinking, we're, we're, our minds are going to not maybe a what, but who is the church, because we're immediately seeing it's a called out people, a called out people of God who are assembled. So maybe the better thing is who is the church, right? Mm-hmm. There's definitely a what is the church because the church building is a part of all that, which yeah. we'll probably, I'm yeah. guessing, get into well, later. And Augustine, uh, one of the he's kind of the bookend of the patriarchs. Um, he he worded it perfectly. There is the invisible church, the church that we're going to talk about tonight, and then there is the visible church, which is the institution, and and we're definitely going to talk about that because you know we are all involved in the institution of the church. And we are all a part of the invisible church as well. So now, Micah, what if someone has, or Tristan, either one, this isn't, <laughs> all, uh, this isn't Micah night. Uh, <clears throat> what if someone has grown up all their life thinking the church is a building? Is there any verses that would, uh, that we could show that could no. disprove that? No, no verses. Just a hunch we have. It's no. just a, what about Acts eleven twenty six? Where <laughs> there's a good one, yeah. That, right. <laughs> let's uh, let's look at that. Acts eleven twenty six says that Barnabas and Saul met with the church, and since he's the grammar guru, I'm going to go to Tristan. Why is that preposition so important? With instead of in. That's the question. So. <laughs> <laughs> why is that there's I, I I have it underlined in my Bible and I have it underlined here in my notes. It says Barnabas and Saul met with right, right, the right, right, church, right, 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 right. not in the church. What's that so important? You can't meet inside of a person. Yeah. That. <laughs> <laughs> Mike just chuckled at his own joke. Oh, you know, you know, things are getting bad when I'm laughing at myself. Okay. That just means you're excited. Anyways, because you can't meet with a building, you have to meet in a building. Um, the so fact that they use I was kind of you, right. you were kind of right, yes. Um, no, yeah. well, you were correct, yeah, yeah, yeah. There is that lady though in England who married a train station. So really? there is, yes. Um, <laughs> so I mean, I, I don't think that applies. <laughs> this building looks what good. What do the kids look like? <laughs> oh gosh. Like, <laughs> Uh, I wonder if that's where Thomas the two, the two, two train came from. Hmm. Okay, back to topic. Back, back on track. Uh, and there's a lot. There's a oh, lot more further <laughs> biblical references to show that the church is not a building. Um, I'll just read off a few. Romans six uh, sixteen five, First Corinthians sixteen nineteen, First Corinthians one two, Second Corinthians one one, uh, and my favorite is Acts nine thirty one, because he talks about the church in Judea, Galilee. And Samaria. So if the church is a building and it's involved in all those places, that's a pretty big building. Yeah. Right. But if it's a group of people, that makes sense because there's a group of people here, a group of people there, and a group of people over here. Mm. So one of the things I always think about is when Jesus says, I, like he says, I'm going to build my church. And, and this is when he's uh, gathered his disciples and he's, He's uh, making progress in his in his uh, ministry on earth, actually calling out his people, um, kind of like what we said with Ecclesia, calling out of a people. But he's building not a physical church, but a people, a people group, right? Yeah. Is that, I don't know if that was one of the ones you listed, but that's one that I think of. It might be. Uh, no, because most of mine, yeah, none of mine were in the Gospels, but that is, yeah. Yep. Where he looks at Yeah. Yeah. So now that we know that the church is a people and not a building, who are those people and where do we see them come from? 
there are actually several different beliefs on that. We're just going to be covering a few of them tonight. Um, but a good place to start is actually Genesis 17, 7 through 8, where we get the Abrahamic covenant. Um, and uh, that reads, And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And so what we see here is um, the first establishment of God's people. First calling his people out. That one. Yeah, which, yes. Ecclesia, I'll call it out. Worded assembly. way better than I could. Ecclesia. That right there. Ecclesia. <laughs> so are you saying that we see Ecclesia in the, in the Old Testament? I said that already. It's not the Greek word, but it is a Hebrew word meaning assembly, and we first see it, um, well, right there, when he's assembl- assembling right. the Israelites, assembling his people. Absolutely. It's- so I most of the views the actually word. start right there, um, based yeah. off of that. So, but it's when it kind of when Jesus comes on the scene is where most of them start breaking off. Exactly. Yeah. So let's talk about those views. Um, actually, I'll start. Let's, cause yeah, let's start with yours. I think we should start with with mine. And one of the views is what's called dispensationalism. Uh, now, I grew up a dispensationalist. Uh, did not know really that I was because in the church I grew up in, there's kind of culture of you just are what everybody else is, you know, ask questions like this. Um, so uh, I think there's probably a lot of people who grew up dispensationalist and don't even know what it is. So definitely want to talk about it tonight. And classical dispensationalists, uh, it's only been around for oh, 200 years. Um, and it wasn't until uh, Schofield and Ryrie became voices for dispensationalists that it actually started catching on. And now in our day and age, uh, in America especially, a, a great portion of the churches, especially Baptist churches, adhere to dispensationalism. Uh, in the in the recent news, you've probably seen a lot of dispensationalists standing around President Trump when he announced that uh, they're moving the embassy back to Jerusalem. Those were all dispensationalist guys. So if you're caught up on news, you've seen them. Uh, so this is what they believe. Uh, dispensationalism basically breaks up time in seven dispensations, which is just an allotted time. Uh, a dispensation is uh, a moment where God reveals himself and his truth to humanity in a new way. And then humanity is held responsible to confirm to that, uh, to conform to that revelation. Uh, usually how it goes is humanity rebels and fails the test, and then four, God judges humanity and introduces a new period of probation or dispensation. So the seven dispensations are innocence, conscience, human government, uh, promise, law, grace, and the millennial kingdom. And those all follow main characters. So you can follow innocence from uh, creation to Adam, uh, conscience is Adam to flood, human government is flood to Tower of Babel, uh, promise is Abraham to Moses, law is Moses to the cross, grace is from the cross to rapture, and then uh, seven is the millennial kingdom. Now, uh, dispensationalists hold a literal, complete, 100% literal uh, interpretation of the Bible, uh, and that's where they, that's basically how they see this. Uh, there are two different types, or there's three different types. There's progressive dispensationalism, and then there's hyper dispensationalism. Uh, so how this relates to the church in Israel is that your classical dispensationalist would say that the church starts on the day of Pentecost. Uh, some would say church starts when Jesus comes on the scene. I've, I've, I, I had a professor in college who that's what he, he held to. Uh, and then your hyper dispensationalist would say that the church doesn't even start until Paul is converted and Paul comes on the scene and starts planning churches. Um, so what we want to point out in this one is the, the, the classical dispensationalists where they, they believe that the church starts on Pentecost and that the, nation of Israel, when the church begins, the nation of Israel is then kind of paused, is kind of 
stopped until more fulfillments of prophecy for the nation of Israel begin, which, you know, when, um, when the nation of Israel had a country again, 70, 80 years ago, they, they dispensationalists saw that as a, as a, as a big thing. Um, and you'll, you, you'll see a lot of dispensationalists because it's a very eschatological, which is just end times viewpoint, um, looking towards the end times. But I don't really want to get into the end times right now because that's not yeah. the topic of our of our series. That's a whole nother. Yeah, I words. I am not prepared <laughs> there. Uh, yeah, I am definitely not prepared there. I'd have to read for probably a good year or so. And, uh, and the still main not to know what you yeah the yeah, main doctrine of dispensationalism that I want to focus on is the relationship between Israel and the church. Most dispensationalists believe God has two people. He has an earthly people and he has a heavenly people, Christians, and and the earthly people is Israel, Jews. Uh, you guys got anything to add to that? That that's that is basically to, to sum it up, what we want to talk about is there that dispensationists believe two people, not the same thing, still going alongside each other in history. Right. So that's the main point. Yeah. That's the main point for tonight. And the reason we're the reason we're covering each of these is because it directly shows the different views of how or who God's people is. Yes. And and going back to Israel and how it relates to the church. And exactly what you just said, but I'm a little bit more of a visual person. person. Mm. So if you look at it like on a chart or something, you can see that you have ethnic Israel and then you have the church. Mm-hmm. They're completely separate, but they're existing along the same time right two parallel lines they're going parallel. towards so they don't they're not the distinction is that it's not one and one is not necessarily greater than the other yes would you agree with that oh yeah yeah, yeah. It, but they're separate god has israel and then god has the church yeah yeah, yeah. well that's a good point so i guess that kind of brings us into our next one so james as whereas you were saying that dispensational uh, theology shows God revealing himself through dispensations. Uh, covenant theology, which is our next one that we're going to cover, would disagree with that and say that God actually, from the very first covenant that we see, which is what uh, Tristan yeah, read, the, the Abrahamic, Abrahamic covenant, covenant yeah. he begins revealing himself, his characters and his attributes to his people through his promises, his covenants. And this is um, existing throughout redemptive history history which is the history of God's work pretty much and we see this occurring in a progressive sort of way now I don't want to get confusing and mix up terms we have another term that we're going to get to probably later called progressive covenantalism mm, I'm not yeah. referring to that I'm I, this is called progressive revelation I know we're throwing a lot of big <laughs> words out there but basically what I'm saying is that throughout time God reveals himself more and more through his covenants, right? And all each one of these covenants are pointing to the cross. So when when God talks about how he passed over a multitude of sin, he was only able to do that because his covenants were moving toward the cross. As he passed over former sins, he was looking at the cross, right? And now as we've had the cross, now we look back to the cross. And it's this sweeping motion centered on the cross. And God revealing himself more and more through the covenant. So it's not, as we transition to one covenant to the other, it's not that one is negated and then we move on to the next one. The fact is that now in Christ, each one of these covenants are fulfilled in Jesus, right? Yeah. So the reason that that um, speaks to what we're talking about is then we, we it answers the question of who is this called out people, who is this called out assembly of God? Um this would make it seem that it's not two separate camps, right? Like yeah. you were talking about with dispensationalism. So, James, you have a verse for us that kind of highlights how this relates to what we're talking about. It shows how Israel and the church exist together. You want to read that? I think it's Romans 11. Yeah, it's Romans 11, and it starts in verse 11. And it says, So I ask, did they stumble in order that they may fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. 
Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, I am speaking to you Gentiles inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump, and if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Right. So what's going on here is we're talking about we have a couple different groups. We have true Israel, and he talks about Gentiles, right? Mm-hmm. So this kind of shows us how they're all engrafted together. He doesn't. He gives this analogy of of a tree and a wild shoot. The wild shoot is the Gentiles, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's not two separate trees that are growing. Like so, dispensationalism would say that there are two separate trees going yeah. growing of the people of God. One is Israel. One is the church today. So whereas this shows a more accurate description of we have these two separate groups, but they're being engrafted together and they are growing as one. So it's important to note here that in the New Testament, the people that we see um, following Jesus, they are not what we would what we would say as Christians when, when we say Christian. Don't get me wrong, like they're they're followers of Christ. But they were Jews, right? They saw themselves as traditional Jews, and the only difference is that they saw themselves as Jews who have who had witnessed the coming of their promised Messiah. So that just proves that it's it's this body that's being developed together. It's not separate things, but even looking at how it progressed throughout history, it's one developing thing that these Jews now become followers of their promised Messiah. It's not two separate groups. Yeah. Did you guys add anything to that? Uh, well, I kind of cut off. I should have read twenty-two through uh, through the end of the the end of the paragraph because he says, yeah. "Note then the kindness and the severity of God, severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in His kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut from what is by for if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted, grafted contrary to nature into a cu- cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? And, um, yeah, I don't know. I just cool. yeah. So then when you ask the question that we asked, who is the church, this answers it. And it's it's pretty epic. I know that's kind of a way overused word, but it's... It's awesome because now we see that who is the church. Mm -hmm. It's this ongoing story that God had a plan that he had foreknown in his sovereignty, and he elected who his people would be over time, and it's all laid out, and he has it all planned out, and he begins it with Abraham, and he moves it throughout time through different covenants, all focusing on on Christ and the cross. That gets me excited. It's pretty cool. It's good. Now... (laughs) In our studying, and this was kind of what was confusing us, um, there is also a theology called replacement theology. And from the reading, it seems that classical covenant theology held to these ideas, but the more modern view of covenant theology does not. So tell us, uh, Tristan, why? what is the replacement theology, and why do we not adhere to it any longer? Yeah, so replacement theology, some people confuse it with covenant theology when it's actually something very different. With replacement theology, they actually believe that the Abrahamic covenant was completely abolished, that there is no longer any covenant for the Israel nation whatsoever. Um, one, one main verse that they use to support that is Matthew twenty one forty three. This is Jesus speaking to the uh, chief priests and the Pharisees. Um, He says, uh, therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. However, uh, people tend to stop there and not go any further into uh, the scripture, which is 
always dangerous because we have a risk of taking things out of context like that. So, so what we're going to do with that is we're actually going to read a little bit before and a little bit after that so that we can kind of see a little bit more context as to what he is referring to in the passage. So um, what it says uh, just before that is, uh, Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures uh, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it was marvelous in our eyes. Uh, therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush them. And then it goes on to see how the chief priests perceive this. Um, and it says, when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowd because they held him to be a prophet. So it literally says right there that he was speaking about them specifically as the ones who were rejecting Christ. Uh, right. the, and so we can see right there where it talks about like it was in, in Romans 11, um, that it was out of their... Those are the branches that have been cut off. Yeah. Exactly, so exactly. The ones that are out of Israel. their disbelief. Yeah. Exactly. Um, not true Israel. Who? Not God, These aren't God's people, right? They're the ones who have been hardened. Yes, right. yes. Right. But And then there are also several verses that I have here that actually would speak against replacement theology as well, such as Galatians six fourteen through 16. Let me get that pulled up here. These are against, you said? Against replacement theology. And for covenant theology? For covenant theology. Yeah. Galatians six fourteen through 16. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything or uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Circumcision or uncircumcision. They've all become if, the right people of God. Yeah. Right. And that clearly moving from... Uh, the Jewish people who had been circumcised to the Gentiles who n didn't have to be circumcised. They're all the same. Right. That's yeah. what it's saying, right? Yeah. Right, right, right. Um, and then I'll just give one more here real quick. Uh, Romans 1, 16 through 17 says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. This could be... Some people would could try to use this for dispensationalism because it's saying it's almost like they're separate. It's saying to the Jew first and then yeah. the Gentile. But it's not necessarily an order of salvation. I think this is more with the context. It's more pointing out that everyone It's not ne because right. it used to be just Jews, right? So yeah. now by adding also the Greek or the Gentiles, it's it's emphasizing that now it's not just this one person or a group of people. It's now everybody. Yeah. Right. I mean, well, and it did go to the Jews first. And yeah. then later on, through Christ, we were all grafted into it. So, um. No, that's really good. Thank you for that. So the error in this is thinking that now today we have replaced the nation of Israel. And exactly. Israel has nothing. Yep. It's kind of a sticky situation because they're so similar, but yet they're also so different. Yeah. Right. We're well, not, we, go ahead. We're not replacing Israel, rather that Israel and the church are now one. Yeah, one and we can see Christ. throughout history how replacement theology and, and thoughts like that have led to some pretty dark and bad places. Mm -hmm. uh, even, even Martin Luther himself, you know, as much as we love the guy, he, towards the beginning of of his of his his career as a theologian, he was very, very nice to the Jews and very hoping that they would be get saved. And then towards the end, the more he read, he kind of started viewing replacement theology and he had some writings that were very angry and violent and, 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 and wrong. So we see how replacement theology can lead to, to kind of some dark and, and bad places. And that's why we want to make that distinction that, that what we believe, because I don't know if you've, we've caught it, but what we adhere to, covenant theology uh reformed right. reformed covenant theology and we wanted to make sure that you knew you knew the difference that because some people would try and tell you oh you're a covenant theologian oh you believe in replacement theology and 
No. And they're not the same at all. They're not the they same, exactly. Not. And and we want to be clear about that. As and well. we, yeah, that, we want, yeah. like we said at the very beginning, we want to, we want this to be as clear as we can make it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now we're not going to sit here and try to tell you that we've got it all figured out. Oh no. Because I might. okay, <laughs> Mike, Mike, Mike no, is I Mike don't. is close. We know he doesn't. <laughs> but Mike wow, <laughs> I don't agree that I do. But that much lack of confidence in me? Come on. Well, you know, you do I, have a lot of time to sit at home and study. And I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, so speaking of historical figures like Martin Luther, let's talk about the history. Uh, I think when we look at theologies like this, looking at church history is is very mm-hmm. important. It's not the final word, but a lot of times when you look at something and you see that something's been done for the majority of 2,000 years or or, or is only brand new, it, it gives you kind of a gives you kind of a ruler to to measure what you believe and why you believe it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, like I mentioned earlier, classical covenant theology from like first century to reformation would most likely adhere to, because they, they looked at biblical interpretation as allegorical and they would probably adhere to a more re, uh, replacement theology. Now the, the danger with the, al- the allegorical interpretation is that it's very easy to twist verses to mean what you want it to mean. So in like Constantine's time, uh, the theologians of his time were very anti-Semitic. That that's one of the reasons that replacement theology is, is kind of dangerous is because it, it can lead you down an anti-Semitic path. And we see Which Christian means, well, anti-Semitic meaning kind of anti-Jew. Uh, yeah, the, and I think most people know what that means. Yeah. It's, it's I, Hey, I didn't for a long time. So it, it's oh, kind of, okay. there might be some people out there. It, it, yeah. So yeah. So anti-Semitic, anti-Jew, and there was a lot of, because they blamed the Jews for killing Jesus. And so you had a lot of first, second, third century Christians who would kind of twist scripture to, to prove replacement theology. Kind of like we see there, kind of stopping using a paragraph of a verse, but stopping not reading the beginning or not reading the end, just reading what kind of fit their, their point And, and we get replacement theology. Uh, what about the more modern covenant theology where do we see that in church history all of it (laughs) so you kind of you kind of hit on it um before just just before i get into the history of covenant theology you kind of hit on it but i want to re-emphasize um the the importance of looking at church history now it's not like we don't it's it's not our source of truth like if we learn, if we looked at church history for everything, like there's a lot of bad stuff that happened in church history, like the Crusades or the Roman Catholic Church, the yeah the, abolishing yeah. of sins. Yeah, <laughs> but the fact is that the early church was a developing church, and they had systems in place to affirm certain things and deny certain things, and it was very much God working in that through through his people, through the elders and affirming truths and, and denying truth. And this is where we see all the councils and confessions come into play. Anytime that there is something that questioned the, the nature of God or something, uh, like a lot of the first councils, they, they dealt with this. So it is kind of important to look at church history as we're looking through these. And I say that especially for covenant theology because we see this existing for pretty much all of church history up until, like you said, James, like the last 200 years or so. And any time we get something new like that, it doesn't necessarily mean it's false, but it's kind of makes you go, oh, wait a second, all of church history has affirmed covenant theology, but you're just now saying, well, wait, we've missed something for the past 1,500 yeah, exactly. years. I yeah. mean, yeah. yeah. So that's that's one of our main reasons for well, I, maybe not even a main reason, but it's a pretty solid reason for looking at covenant theology. As the truth, yeah. We also have a lot. Do we want to get into these, the scriptures that we have for covenant theology? Yes, we do. Yeah. We do have some scripture. We want to make sure that we don't just say, yeah. this is what we, this believe, is what we believe and yeah. this is why you should believe it. We want to make sure that this is rooted in God's right. word. And um, Tristan, you hit on already a lot, several that are in favor of replacement theology, but there are, are a lot more, and we kind of want to... In favor of replacement? Or? I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for catching that. 
Plot yeah. twist: We're in favor of replacement <laughs> theology. <laughs> no, <laughs> we have a council of pipes, a council of pipes and piety right council. here and right now. So we have several. Um, so Galatians three twenty six through twenty nine says, "For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith." There's a couple key, two key words there. It's through faith and you all. Um, remembering that dispensationalists would say that they're separate groups. Uh, replacement theology would say that one replaces the other, but this is saying that for in Christ Jesus, everyone, you all, are sons of God through faith. And it goes on to say, for all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. This is another key point. I'm getting excited, guys. This is like everything we talked about in one verse. So we have one one group of people through faith, an extension of Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, right? We're all descendants of Abraham. It's this progressive revelation through all these covenants. Cool. <laughs> James, you want to read the... <laughs> yeah. Let's... I'm nerding out here. So uh, then we also see in Galatians, Galatians 3, 7 through 9. So then, understand that those who believe are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, proclaimed the gospel to Abraham ahead of time, saying, All the nations will be blessed in you. So then those who believe are blessed along with Abraham the believer. So this kind of goes to what the idea that Micah was getting at earlier that the Old Testament has been pointing towards Messiah and now we point back towards the Messiah. Uh, so you would see a, a, a believing Jew in the temple in the Old Testament. He would know that that sacrifice that they would did daily, that that, that wasn't permanent. They're going to have to come back the next day. But he knew that eventually God would would complete that work in Messiah, in the Messiah, in Christ. And we look back. So uh, it, it goes to that, that everything has been pointing towards Christ. Now everything points back towards Christ. And we're all children of Abraham in that. Yeah, that's good. So the next one I've got here is actually Romans 9, uh, 4 through 7. Uh, it just starts, they are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God, over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham, because they are his offspring. So that says right there that there are going to be some in Israel, the nation of Israel, that yeah. are not saved because they are not right. a part of Abraham's offspring. But those who are even grafted in or those who have faith in Christ are mm -hmm. Abraham's offspring. As you were reading that too, I was just thinking back to when we first started this episode, defining who the church is as a called out people. Like there are some words that you said like adoption and like God adopting his, this people and electing this people. And I mean, I don't know. I just thought that was cool, which just further demonstrates how it's one body. Yeah. One yeah. people. Well, Absolutely. and something I was noticing is that we, so we printed out this form and it was because we wanted to make sure that we had good ideas. And this basically wasn't a, a defensive replacement theology. And it used that verse that he just read but it only used like a portion. And that kind of goes back to what we were talking about, how the, the dangers of interpreting verses that the, those first believers, when they were first kind of getting through covenant theology and thought covenant theology and replacement theology were one, they did a lot of that twisting scripture and only using half a verse. And that, that proves our point right there. And then what, what Tristan did is he opened the, the Bible and then read the whole paragraph <laughs> and it disproved it completely. Thought. Yeah. What like, a thought. <laughs> so Actually opening the Bible that has, and reading it. That has <laughs> more than just replacement theology. Like, don't do that on your own. You know, right. read the whole paragraph. Life lessons from read pipes the whole, and piety. Yeah, you know, that, that goes into a deeper thing than just who is the church and what is the church. I just want to yeah, throw that out there. Like, that, yeah. that hit me in the head. Don't, don't do that. 
Yeah. <laughs> do not do that. Fornication. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> So we got a couple no context more. for that. That judgment is with you. Very yeah. real. No context for that. <laughs> All right. So we got a couple more. Um, and so the next one is Ephesians 3, 5 through 6. And it says this. Now, this secret was not disclosed to people in former generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, namely through that through the gospel, the Gentiles are now fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus. This kind of depicts the verse we read about being grafted into one body, and it's talking about how now there's there's still existing this Jewish people, but now the Gentiles are now fellow heirs, they're now fellow members, and they partake in the promise of Christ Jesus. That kind of sums it up pretty well. Okay. So James is going to read another verse, but the... I just want to highlight the importance of this. This kind of sums up everything that we've said about covenant theology. And this is kind of where it begins, where where we see the prediction of this new covenant or the prophecy of this new covenant coming into action and where we are kind of bridged into the new covenant. You want to read that, James? Yeah. Well, and, and to go back to what Tristan said too, this new covenant, how it started with the Jews and then right. went to the Gentiles. Yeah. And this kind of... Uh, So it's Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 33. Indeed, a time is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. For they violated that agreement, even though I was a faithful husband to them, says the Lord. But I will make a new covenant with the whole nation of Israel after I plant them back in the land, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts and minds, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Yeah. So it's no longer this old covenant. It's going to be a new covenant that's within the hearts of his people, and they're not going to have to learn of who God is. They'll just know who God is because they're his children. Well, and that's almost a good way to kind of sum up the whole who is the church the church is the people whose hearts have been right written on by God. We we yeah. can never know who the true church is. You, Micah, Tristan, mm-hmm. we can guess, and we and you know, and, and later on, we'll talk about membership and how membership kind of is a is almost a I don't want to say membership to the club, but it's almost a stamp of we believe that you are part of the church. But the the truth is that. That the church is invisible and it is a, a group of people that only God mm-hmm. truly knows. And they're his people who and they're he's called out. Yes. And he's yeah. circumcised their heart, if you want to put it into the, the Yeah, into language. the biblical yeah. Yeah. Our, their hearts have been regenerated. And that wasn't just in the new covenant, like even in the old covenant he had yes. his people who were still saved by their faith. Yeah. Right. And those people that were looking forward. So then why is it so important that the church is a called out people by a covenant keeping God? To me, this is like one of the most important things. I don't want to be like hyperbolic here, but this is one of the most important things that I've studied because there's today in the church, there's such a disconnect between what we view the church as and looking back through history at God's people. Yeah. There's this disconnect between somehow God can sovereignly elect his people in the Old Testament, but now it's not that way. We have to make the choice. Yeah. It's our works to accept, right? Yeah. Well, and it's almost, this is why it almost goes back to the very beginning, why ecclesiology is so important. Right. Bad ecclesiology has now led to bad soteriology or you know, yeah. the the theology of salvation and has led to bad it's all, just a snowball yeah yeah so We're, why no, no no you go ahead so this is so important to me because it first of all well, it tells you who god's people is but it highlights god's sovereignty and we do not choose on our own capability to be followers of christ god as we have seen through the Old Testament, and God is not a changing God. This is how he's operated through the covenants 
all throughout redemptive history. He is a sovereign God who chooses based off his own will for his own glory, who his people will be, who he will call out. And that, if nothing else, highlights grace, right? To be one of God's children shows his grace. He, on no conditions, nothing that we've done, because we know we cannot do it on our own. We cannot work our way to salvation. He just graciously has chosen us to be his people. Mm, Micah laying out the gospel of grace there. So that unconditional grace that Micah was just talking about leads us to an unconditional love. Because if, if, if God wasn't so loving, then, then there would be no reason for him to bestow that grace upon us. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Um, yeah. Micah's just better with the words. No. You know? Well, I... <laughs> I think all that's leading into what you yeah, it all, yeah, I not think a whole it, lot to add to. Yeah. Yeah, Just, I agree. This is all leading out of God's sovereignty. We have such a small view of God. And just look at everything that we looked at tonight. Look at everything. Just listen to just, everything that we said tonight. And, I mean, not just what we said, but what other people said, what the Bible says. Like, God is on a mission and nothing stops him he's on a mission to save his people it has nothing to do with us we can't put the spotlight on ourselves. no sorry no 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 no. <laughs> yeah so we started this episode with a question who is the church and i think j.i packer in his book concise theology kind of answers that perfectly in the first paragraph of his chapter called the church and it says the church, Greek, ecclesia, meaning assembly, exists in, through, and because of Jesus Christ. Thus, it is a distinctive New Testament reality. Yet, it is at the same time a continuation through a new phase of redemptive history of Israel, the seed of Abraham, God's covenant people of the Old Testament times. The differences between the church and Israel are rooted in the newness of the covenant by which God and his people are bound to each other. The new covenant under which the church lives, 1 Corinthians 11.25, Hebrews 8.7.13, is a new form of the relationship whereby God says to a chosen community, I will be your God, you shall be my people. Uh, and then Jeremiah 31.33 is there, which we read earlier, uh, and then goes on. Both the continuity and the discontinuity between Israel and the church reflect this change in the form of the covenant which took place at Christ's coming. I think that just kind of sums it up That's good. well. Yeah. Thank you for listening to this episode of Pipes and Piety. Uh, if you enjoyed this first episode in our series of Ecclesiology, uh, stay tuned for next month when we will be talking about why is it important to go to church, uh, to be a part of a local church, especially since tonight we, we talked about that the church is not a place that you go. It is a people that you are a part of. So uh, we hope you'll join us for that one. Uh, that basically is the question that started this whole series off. So mm -hmm. we're excited for that one. Uh, other things we have, we have why is church membership so important? Uh, why is serving in the church so important? Leadership, both men and women. Liturgy, worship. We're, we're going to try and touch on everything that... We got all sorts of leadership. We, coming up. Did you say leadership? I did. I said oh. leadership in men and women. And we actually have all these planned out. Yes, we actually have we planning. We, we have a calendar and everything. Until, what was it, August? Yeah, yeah right yeah, now we're, we're in August, August, and that's just like half. Done. That's why I said, yeah, it's, this is going to be probably a year or so, and uh, we hope you'll stick with us on that. Uh, but again, if you liked this episode, please leave us a, a comment, a rating, a five-star rating, if you liked it, if you really enjoyed it, on iTunes. You can stop by our Facebook page, Twitter page, Instagram page. Just search Pipes and Piety. We should be, we're the ones with a cross and a pipe in our logo. Uh, you can also, if you have questions, uh, we do have our email, pipesandpiety at gmail.com, but we also have a number that you can text and you can call. And, and Micah, what is that number? Yeah, it's 872-256-3265. And that's not just text, like he said. You can actually call and leave a voicemail and it'll... Turn it into. Yeah, it'll text. transcribe it. We can yeah. listen to it. We can yeah. transcribe it. Now uh, we won't. We won't have the phone on us 
at all times. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that'll probably um, be a, a once a week check or maybe yeah. twice a week check. So, uh, it, the fastest way to contact us is probably just through email yeah, or, for, or Facebook message. We'll all mm-hmm. of us will get it instantaneously. And if it's an answer for but, the show, we might read it on the show and, and try and answer it. And if it's not a you know a lengthy thing, if we can just answer it in a yeah, yeah. short manner, we'll try and answer it on the show. Um, we also have a Patreon. Uh, one of the things that Patreon allows people to do is come behind small projects like we are that we are here. Like we're just three guys sitting at a table. And uh, right now we have a goal of trying to meet a hundred dollars a month, and that would just allow us to buy resources and uh, for for books and other things that cost money that we need to to study for these because we like like we said earlier we want to be. Uh, knowledgeable about what we're talking about. We don't want to just talk and talk and talk and not know what we're talking about. Uh, it would also allow us to buy uh, sound equipment if something broke. Um, so that would really help us out if you'd like to be a part of that. It's patreon.com slash pipes and piety. Uh, our goal is $100 a month. 